We're gonna roast the new washed Ethiopian coffee that we have sourced for you all at home at Mill City. Super exciting for me because washed Ethiopians are my favorite coffee. But before I get into that and in too much detail, I'm gonna talk about the 3K. So I have one of our new 3Ks right here to my left. Um, we're now doing different colors. And so you can see this one, I think we're calling this one Army Green. You know what I mean? I'm referring to this one as the Third Army 3K. So if any of you guys know Patton's Third Army, uh, a little World War II history out there, it's kind of funny and, and cool. Uh, but I'm also just weird, so sorry about that. All right, so we have our lovely 3K here. So it's a three kilogram roaster, um, double wall drum, just like all of our machines. But this is a different 3K, if any of you are noticing the difference, it's got the full digital control panel. Uh, I really like the digital control panel. One of the reasons why I like the digital control panel is it's a little bit easier to replicate roasts. It's a little more exact, or I shouldn't say a little more exact, it is very exact. I now have digital controls with whole numbers that I, that I work off of for roast air and for gas pressure. So if you guys know our machines, you know that traditionally we have a needle valve somewhere down here, and that's how we would manipulate gas pressure. You know what I mean? So now I've got a digital controller to manipulate that and I'm using 0.1 or numbers or a thousand. So it's like point something or one point something, two point something. And roughly that's KPA. So a thousand on my digital gas control would be one KPA. So that's basically the way the gas runs. The airflow runs in Hertz, which is kind of wacky because that's like an electronic thing. But we make reference to Hertz numbers with the good old lighter trick and then we can basically use those numbers for our different airflows. So for me, on this machine, 19 hertz is my low airflow, 28 hertz is my medium airflow, and 36 hertz will be my high airflow. Um, so that's really nice because it's very exact. And then I also have my magnahelic airflow gauge actually recording airflow through the drum that I can then correlate to keep that all consistent when potentially the roast air fan gets clogged up or my ductwork starts to get clogged up and impede my airflow. All right, so I'm coming down in temp. That's what we're waiting for right now is I have that roaster quite a bit hot, quite a bit hotter. I like to heat the roaster up higher above my charge temp and then, then I set my roast air to my starting roast air setting and then I like the roaster to come down to my charge temp. So that's what we're doing right now. I'm just filling the time till we get ready to charge. Oh, I'm still coming down. So yeah, so the 3K, um, I really like the 3K's cooling tray. Just so you know, it's got a very wide cooling tray. I tend to think that the ratio of width to the diameter of the drum basically helps the cooling um, ratio, I should say. So this has got a very wide cooling tray. So it doesn't have, the beans are only a couple beans thick. So it cools the coffee very fast. It's one of the things I like about the 3K. You also notice the 3K is on a cart. The 3K is a cart roaster. So we have the actual cooling fan, unlike on the other roasters on the side of the roaster, the cooling fan is actually right below the cooling tray in the housing as part of the cart. So that's really cool because it shrunk up the footprint on the 3K. So it makes the 3K quite a bit smaller footprint size for like a cafe. So ideally this would kind of be like ultimate like cafe roaster, shop roaster, something like that. You can also go down to a pretty small charge. I've roasted 500 gram charges on this roaster all the way up to 3.3 kilograms and had a pretty good result. So yeah, that's one of the things I like. Plus it makes the cooling tray line really short. So the cleaning for the cooling tray line is super quick because you don't really have much cooling tray line, which is really helpful if you're a production coffee roaster and you actually have to clean your roasting equipment. Okay, so we're getting a little bit closer to charge. I do have my airflow already set. I even have my initial gas setting already set. So like I said, I have a digital controller for the gas. So I have it preset and all I have to do is hit the ignition switch, which you saw me turn off when I first started the video. I just need to hit that button and then the igniter will ignite and the gas will go right up to the level I already set. So that's pretty solid. Um, also on these new uh, digital control panels, on the control panel, unlike the previous models where all you had was one thermocouple readout, we now have three thermocouple readouts on the control panel. So that's really nice. I have my ET and my IT temperature uh, thermocouples reading on the control panel right here. So that's super solid for me. Timer, just like we always had the timer. But now these digital machines have a few other bells and whistles. Like you can see up here, there's a little magnetic sensor on the green hopper. So when I open up the green hopper, it'll auto start my timer and auto start my data logging. It's kind of helpful. Um, 
Over here, you can see on the drum door, when I open up the drum door, I'll break that sensor too, and that'll automatically turn on the cooling tray fan and the cooling tray arms. Another kind of helpful thing. Um, classically in those cities, we have a roaster cooling tray cover. Same, same deal here. Turns on the arms, turns off the arms. Um, for you all that know me, I like to use it as a switch. So I have my cooling arms on all the time, and I just use this to turn them on and off. Um, and then we also have another little sensor on the cooling tray out chute. And basically what that does is, as soon as I open up that chute, it turns the cooling tray arms on, um, assuming that we're trying to get coffee out of the cooling tray. Kind of nice, and then when I close it, they're back off. So that's a couple little helpful, like, uh, I think of them as roaster assistants. You know, we're not, this isn't automation, so we're not trying, I'm not trying to say or explain these things in the context of automation. This is not automation. I think of these as roaster assistants. These are just little digital controls that are hooked up to magnetic sensors that just kind of help you be more successful. It frees up a little bit of the bandwidth of your mind to focus on your roast and less on, oh my God, do I have that switch switched? Are my cooling tray arms on? Yada, yada, yada. Even the best of us will forget those things. So we're coming up on um, 10th, I think we're getting really close. So this is exciting. So I think, I think I've talked quite a bit about the 3K. Um, oh, but, it, but I, didn't, I didn't talk about the map. So also you guys might notice we have this new matte pebble finish. Super cool, super neat. One of the weird things I'm noticing is it doesn't pick up dirt. So if you want to get super technical, you can go in and look at the like microscopic images of stainless steel versus pebble matte finish. It's really wild stuff. Okay, we're almost at charge temp. I want to talk about the Lemu coffee because it's super exciting. I'm really excited about this coffee. Limu, Limu, I think is, I, I, I tried to practice the pronunciation. I'm sure I'm screwing it up. But um, traditionally, I love Wash Yirgacheff. Yirgacheff is a city. So the city is actually kind, I think it's pretty much in the region of Sadamo, which is kind of confusing because we think of Yirgacheff and Sadamo as completely different coffees. Okay, here we are. Now we're gonna get roasted and I'll get back to coffee. All right, so I already have my, I, I pre-planned my roast. If all, if it, for you all that have been in roasting class, watch my videos, or if you want to learn how I roast, you can take the virtual class. I like to pre-plan my first two minutes to a minute of my roast so that I don't have to spend a lot of time in those early moments of the roast thinking about what I'm trying to do. Because really, you're not going to see the effect of what you're doing in a roast until three, four minutes. So if I'm sitting there thinking and making decisions three, two minutes of my roast, I'm not really sure what I'm using to make those decisions. So I make those decisions before I start a roast. Then I'm freed up to basically do what I need to do up until two or three minutes. And then at two or three minutes when things are actually happening in the roast and I can, and I have what I would call actionable data to make decisions on as a roaster, then I can do that. So that's kind of the way I plan my roast. All right, so we're coming up on one minute. So you guys know, I, I'm doing a two minute soak on this roast. That's pretty extreme. I think my longest soak in any roast profile that I've ever created is maybe at 240 seconds. Pretty long too, you know what I mean? So, and the reason being, for me, a soak is always based on the machine. If your machine can't handle the soak, then you don't do it, you know what I mean? We're trying to roast coffee within a certain time frame, and that's what matters, not you know, having some kind of specific turning point, anything like that. So I'm doing this because this machine is fast and powerful, and I could probably do a three minute soak and still get to my, my phase event for this first phase. All right, we're still coming up on two minutes. I just have my data logging running in the background. That's always helpful. I like to use that in reference for my ET temperature and kind of where that's going, in reference for my ET temperature and where that's at, things of that sort. But then I also use it for my live rate of rise. I'm gonna say we're almost to two minutes. And there we are. I'm gonna hit the button a little early, but that's okay. Just so you guys know too, I'm running roughly 45 hertz on the drum, which equivalates to 60 RPMs in real uh, revolutions per minute of the drum. All right, now I can hear the burner sets running. It's burning, I don't have to worry about that. As a roaster, it's always good to verify that your, your burner is actually lit and all burners are burning. But I can hear it, and I'm pretty comfortable with this roasting machine as I'm pretty present when I roast on it. So I kind of have a, uh, I don't know what you call it, like a sixth sense for when the machine is running and everything's proper. All right, I'm gonna take a few seconds just to make sure that I'm actually roasting this coffee right. My first event, and I'm also gonna record things too as I go. So I have a pre-set uh, pre up two minutes, so I'm just gonna verify that what I 
pre-recorded I did. And then any variance on the record too. Looking good? So we have our initial setting, everything's good to go. Yeah, so my, my two minute plan is partially because I do a lot of these and I do a lot of teaching, but it's also something that I created before I ever taught as a roaster. And so it's just a really helpful kind of concept to, to basically get your roast started off strong. It's way easier to start off with momentum and to start off with a plan than it is to start off with a cool machine and not knowing what you're doing. I think that's the only real cardinal sin in roasting is doing a roast with no plan. That's, you know, it's disrespectful to the product, to be really honest. All right, we're going to three minutes and 30 seconds. Now we can start to look at our rate of rise, in my opinion. I think we're about to hit 30. We have 28 ROI, it's pretty solid. Good amount of churning in there, we're all good. All right, so I'm gonna get back to this Lemu, Lemu coffee. So it's another region of Ethiopia. When I, I was only in coffee for eight months when my company that I worked for as a roaster sent me to Ethiopia. I can't, I, I could never thank them enough. It changed my life forever and it basically made it so I can never have, a, like your first love is always your first love. And my first love in coffee was to wash your geschäft. You know what I mean? Partially because eight months into coffee, I got to go to Ethiopia, and eventually I got to go to Yurgachev on that trip. And that was amazing. So I love Wash Yurgachev. I've always loved the clean, floral nuance of those uh, coffees. Um, before I became a coffee person, I was a food wine person. My favorite wine is actually a V&A. A V&A is a very delicate uh, white with no oak, and it has a lot of fruity notes a lot of citrusy notes and a lot of floral notes, and it's very, very delicate. So it's really like a first course to maybe just drinking it alone by itself because anything else could basically overcomplicate it. All right, we're coming up on, we're about a minute from my goal for a dry end. Okay, we're looking pretty good. I'm gonna verify that I'm not missing anything. That, yep, so I have an air increase and a fuel decrease coming up. So I'm gonna do that quickly and I'll get right back to you on the discussion around uh, the roast, or the actual green coffee. I'm gonna make my first deviation. I'm gonna lower my fuel, and I'm gonna wait and do it 30 seconds later than my plan. So I feel like I'm moving a little slow. And that is my roaster gut. And you might have seen my other videos, I talk about roaster gut versus roaster brain. All right, so there we go. So I made my adjustment. We're coming up on dry end though. So I'm gonna tune out of the, the, the actual green coffee talk for a second, just because I really wanna call uh, the first phase event correctly. All right, we're starting to see a good amount of color change. So I think we're gonna be a little late. My goal was about right now, and we're not getting it yet in the try -out. So that was the reason why I went, I went a little late on my fuel adjustment. Because my first fuel adjustment is lowering. I'm always lowering my fuel. Not always, but 90% of the time lowering my fuel as I roast. So that first fuel adjustment was to lower the gas. At that moment, I didn't feel like we were moving fast enough, so I didn't lower it. I waited 30 seconds to lower it, so I kept higher gas for 30 seconds. That was, that was to hopefully get that first phase event moving a little faster. So we're a little late in that first phase event, but nothing too bad. All right, I think I'm gonna call it right there. Okay, so I just called, uh, there we go. So I just called the dry end, dry end or green to yellow transition. I just made the call on that. Pre to that, I had increased my air and lowered my fuel. And that's very traditional for the way I roast. All right, so back to the Lamu. So on that first trip to a coffee country, I got to go to Ethiopia, and on that trip, I actually went to Sedamo, went to Yergeshefe, stayed in Yergeshefe, the city actually, and uh, through that, I got exposed to a few other coffee regions that produce coffee in Ethiopia, Lakempe and Lamu. And both of those were exciting, yummy cups on the table. But I worked for a company that, we didn't use an import, and so it was very hard to bring in new origins, uh, new regions of origins. So basically that was like 2007, I think, when I first got exposed to the, the Moo coffees of Ethiopia, and they were very exciting. But it's not till today, so that would be what, 13 years later? Yeah, 13 years later that I actually have that coffee to roast and develop. 
So it's super exciting. Cafe Imports does a crazy cool program with Tag and Tula that do new copies. So we do all of our purchasing through Cafe Imports. And so I brought in, I think, around six different Tag and Tulas and cut through them, and they were all amazing. And really, I was just trying to replace our YCFCU wash year to chef. So I was really looking for a similar type cup to replace that. That was the goal in this. And honestly, a couple of takers and tulas were better. And so right away, I was like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be amazing. So I knew right away that I'd be able to bring in a Lamu, and then the two or three that rose up in that cup in to be the best of the, of the group were pretty amazing. So I'm just gonna be really honest. If you roasters at home are roasting that YCFCU and you liked it or loved it, dude, definitely you're gonna love this coffee. This coffee I scored a quarter point higher. Really, I probably could have went a half point higher. It is the same coffee with a plus. A little bit more orange, a little bit more floral, a little bit more sweetness, a little bit more juiciness. So you can drop this coffee right into that old profile and it'll create a slightly variant version of floral and citrus that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna go on a limb and say, you're gonna love it. You're gonna love it and to compare apples to apples, the YCFCU with the Lamu in the same roast profile, that'd be pretty killer. And then we do a post roast blend, 50% of each, that would be ultimate. Then you'd have like the ultimate washed EPO blend. Then if you had a Gucci and a Saddam laying around, get a quad blend like that, whoa. You need to invite me over if you do that. That's my idea. All right, I'm back to the roaster. Okay, so now I'm coming up on the second phase of event, which would be first crack. And I'm looking pretty solid on that. I have one more airflow adjustment I do right around outlier time. So I like to think of the first outlier as 30 seconds pre-crack. And that's when I do an airflow adjustment. All right, our rate of rise is right at the 13 range, which is pretty great. I think I want like, I've been running into crack with this roast at 13, somewhere between 12 and 14 hour walk. So 13 is pretty much right in the middle and I'm holding 13 right now. And we're, we're about a minute from the goal of crack. But just so you guys know, or you know this already, I went 30 seconds long in dry phase. And when you do stuff like that, you only have the dry phase to reconcile a profile. You know, if you go long and you go short at dry end, then you just add on your times of your phase events to that. So my goal is gonna be 11 for crack. Well, I'm gonna extend that out now to 11.30 because of the 6.30 dry end. So I want that mid phase to be five minutes. That's the, that, that is the cup. If I start to deviate in the mid phase, I'm gonna affect the overall cup. Not that you all are gonna drink this coffee, but you know, I can try to be honest. All right, so we're about a minute from our goal time for crack. So everyone at home, cross your fingers, cross your toes. You need an outlier in about 15 seconds. All right, I'm thinking we're gonna be close. Thinking it could be a 30 seconds long, so we could have just added on a minute to the overall roast. But just so you guys know, when we hit crack, this roast is plus 145. We're gonna stick to that. That's golden, you know what I mean? We're not gonna deviate off that. We just keep working like that. As you progress, you just add that time in and you just extend out the overall time. If you start to shorten phase events because of other ones that have been extended, then you're really deviating from your initial cup. And that's the key is to keep the cup consistent. Okay, we're coming up on it. I haven't heard an outlier. This is a fresh, brand new coffee, so it should pop pretty solid. And we're not moving it that slow. If you do a, oh, there's an outlier. If you do a really slow, low and slow roast, you can sometimes basically kind of in a way slowly cook out the moisture and then you don't get a big pop. So I just increased my airflow, and then I'm just going to lower my fuel too. Oh, now we're getting a little bit more. I'm not calling crack yet. I like to call crack as three pops that are part of the roll. Okay, right there. So 12, 10. So now plus 145 would mean 13.55 for final for final time. All right. Some of you at home might be thinking, I'm doing a pretty small roast on a smaller roaster of a small bean. You might be thinking, dude, I do my EPO wash in like sub 10 minutes. That's awesome, I'm glad, you know what I mean? I really hope you like your cup. I think that's a pretty efficient roast too. If you can knock out five or six roasts in an hour, you're making some money. 
And I'm just going to share with you all my best wok Ethiopian roast was on a 2.5 kg machine and it went 18 minutes and 40 seconds. And there was 20 other roasters doing a wheat roasting class. And of all the roasts we did, which each roaster did four roasts, and we had the master cupper, that roast won. So it wasn't me that's saying that roast was awesome, although it was awesome. So it's not all about time. All right. So 1355, is that right? 12, 10, 13, 10, yeah, 1355. So we're looking like we're about 35 seconds from finish. I'm liking what's going on here. We're now down in about a seven ROR. So we're slowly declining our rate of rise. Really, we're trying to run it right to the end. I don't want too much momentum, but I also don't want to lose my momentum. I'm starting to smell a nice kind of, I don't know what you call it. It's like a sweet kind of lemony bread smell, I want to say. Oh, we're coming right up on it. And I'm liking it. So I always like to make a decision in the trial. I'm liking that development. I'm liking it. So we're going to do it right there. 13.52. So I dropped it three seconds early. But it was right on my time. Or right on my temperature. Because 426 PID was my goal temp. All right. One of the keys for all roasters, as soon as the coffee's out of the drum, close the drum door, because you're just gonna suck all that heat out of your drum and on your cooling beans. I'm gonna turn off the ignition switch so I don't heat the roaster back up. And then I'm gonna put the coffee in the tray and let it cool a little bit. All right. So yeah, once again, that Lemu coffee is lovely. It roasts up very consistently. Like if I was to set up a cupping with you all at home that love that YCFCU or just love Wok Ethios, and I just was to provide this for you as a brew, you would really enjoy it. It's heavily orange, it's got a little bit of Meyer lemon, a fair amount of stone fruit, it's quite floral, you know, it's got a nice juicy acidity, it's very soft and round. I mean, honestly, it's, I'm roasting it very, very light, and it's still balanced. Like, I have an air pot that I brewed this morning at nine, and I'm still drinking it, and I think it's four o'clock. It's been sitting in the air pot all day and it's still, and it's, it's a light, it's still not sour. Like I just poured some in my cup and tried it to see if it was sour and it was round and juicy still. So that's a solid coffee. I think it's a really good value. Cafe's done some crazy great work with Tegantula. So we're just really excited at Mill City to have a Tegantula, but also personally to have a Lumu coffee and just to showcase different areas and different uh, flavor experiences in Ethiopia, as Ethiopia is one of uh, my favorite uh, coffee origin countries. All right, um, we're done with the roast. Um, I'm going to let the coffee cool a little bit. Yeah, um, I hear that we have a couple questions that might have came in during the video. So I'm going to basically just make sure my coffee's cooling and then we can get to those questions. And you guys also might notice that I don't run my cooling arms the whole time. That's something that I figured out from roasting a lot of coffee is uh, I'm not gonna tell you why, but think about the extraction of espresso through a porta filter. Think of that and what you do when you build the perfect like espresso puff in a porta filter to extract a yummy shot of espresso. Think of that concept in coffee and then apply that to cooling tray. And that's all I'm gonna say. Uh, Espresso33 asked, what is the ideal temperature charge for this specific coffee or for a similar Ethiopia coffee that is in season right now? Espresso33 asked, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize, what would be the ideal charge temperature for this Ethiopian wash Lemieux or a similar type Ethiopian coffee? Wow, Espresso33, I kind of don't want to answer your question. And this isn't because I don't have an answer for it. It's because I'm starting to basically reinvent some of my profiles. I roasted for 13 years somewhere. And now that I've left and started to kind of recreate my roasting, you know, for three years now I've been roasting a new machine, different coffees. I'm starting to kind of integrate some of my old profiles back into my lineup. And that's basically at the root of what I'm doing with my coffees. I used to roast on a machine where we charged every coffee at the same temp because that was the only way we could get that machine to run the profiles accurately. So it's super weird. So with this coffee, huh. Okay, I'm gonna say that there might not be an ideal temperature. 
I'm gonna let one of my cats out of the bag or whatever, however you wanna say this, for this roast profile, for this coffee, I've experimented with five different charge ranges and the same profile to come up with what I would consider the best charge temperature for this coffee. And I'm gonna tell you what it is for this, even though this is kind of something I haven't wanted to share with other people. These are, I'm trying to create like a separate uh, grouping of profiles that I'm just calling Derek's Golden Nuggets. And this is my first one that I've done. So with this coffee, I'm charging at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the secret to this roast. I'm sorry if that sounds crazy. I'm sorry if that means that your machine's not gonna get to green to yellow in six minutes. You saw this went a little long. That's part of this roast, you know what I mean? Is I'm stretching out that dry phase. There's something going on with that that makes this coffee really round, really juicy, heavily nuanced, but then I'm having a short development phase. So that's some of the tricks I'm playing is I'm extending the times in the dry in the mid to then kind of compact the development phase and then I'm getting all the bells and the whistles that the coffee has to, to offer. So I would say 350 to 450 is okay for charge temps. Wild, I know. I'm charging this one at 350. I'm thinking 350 to 385 might be the ideal range for this coffee. But that's that's neither here nor there because it's a lot of thermocouples, it's gonna be a lot of thermocouple placement. Like temperature from machine to machine to machine isn't the same. So I'm sorry, Espresso 33, if my question, or my answer didn't answer your question, but I'm hoping that I'm guiding you to a place of success. So if I was you, wanna try this profile, charge at 350. You can hit your green to yellow transition at six minutes, then add five, then add 145. You should be in the same cup zone as me, and you're gonna get a nice cup. Good question though. Next question. What gas level did you start the roast on? You mentioned KPA, but I don't think you said where you were st on start on the Yeah, uh, excellent. So another question was gas that was, level. That was trailblazer roasting. Trailblazer roasting was wondering what my initial gas setting would be. Okay, so my initial gas setting on this, you're right, I didn't say 0.9 KPA. That was what it was. This machine runs on max gas at 27 kPa, but just so you guys know, this is this is the most powerful roaster as far as low inputs and high performance that I've ever roasted on. The highest I've ever run gas on this machine is 1.4 for a 3 kg charge, and I think I hit green and yellow in three minutes and 50 seconds, which is too fast in my opinion. That's why I'm going with the lower charge temp. So, okay, this is kind of weird. This is just the way my brain works, and I apologize. So. This machine is really solid for my low charge temps because it's so powerful and it performs so well with minimal fuel input. If I was to try a 350 charge on the 20K that's right to that's right over there, that would be a really hard roast to do in the time frame that I'm trying to do it at. So I'm lucky because I have seven roasting machines at my whim and disposal. You all at home probably have one. So you kind of got to reinvent the wheel a little bit and gain your roaster to do the best you can with what you got. So yep. So roughly, in percentage-wise, what would that be? 30-some percent, maybe 30 to 40 percent of max fuel is what I used at a uh, two-minute soak. Yep. Uh, Fatal F Coffee asks, what temp is your dry end with this coffee? So I'm going to drop the glue drink because I think we're good. I'm going to also do something really quick, too, while you're all here in camera, which is something that I want everyone at home to know. Once the coffee is cool, let it out of the cooling tray. You know what I mean? You don't want coffee hanging out in the cooling tray while you're roasting when it's cool. You don't want coffee hanging out in the cooling tray while it's cool with the fan on. That's actually oxidizing the coffee, or better said, staling the coffee. If I see if I see cool coffee in a cooling tray, it kind of makes me upset. It kind of brings out the old chefness in me. It's not not a nice person. I have to kind of bite my tongue so I don't say something mean. Even to myself. Okay, so I just had to do that because I had cool coffee in the cooling tray and it was in there, and so it needs to come out. Okay, sorry. Back to the question. Okay, I think I was just corrected. I think it's Fat Elf Coffee? Fat Elf Coffee. Yes. Asked, what temp is your DE with this coffee? Dry in? Okay, yeah, so Fat Elf Coffee was wondering what temp by dry in. So that's a little strange. These new machines are reading temperatures that are a little different. I think it's because of thermocouple placement. So oddly enough, with this coffee, honestly, my dry end temp was um, 
348 on the PID. That's that's high. I like to consider dry end. I think a dry end right on 300. That's kind of what I think of, and I, I have no clue what the real temperature internally in the seed actually is. But on my experience on roasting machines, the average would be 300. But on this machine with this coffee, dry end was actually 348, which is really strange because I roasted a natural Colombian right before and it was 323. So I'm not 100% sure why this coffee is just reading such a high temperature at dry end. It might have been the thermocouple coverage with the charge. That, that's one thing. If you're manipulating your charge weights, then you're changing the amount of the amount of coffee that's covering your thermocouples. And that's gonna change the way they're gonna read. And so I was using a 2 kg charge and that might have been why I was having such a high dry end temp because that thermocouple probably wasn't covered very much by the green. That, that's what my gut tells me because usually I see this coffee turn around the 320s. The 348 was the actual Fahrenheit temp on the PID. Uh, Friday Coffee Roasters. What was the roast size and what percent of max roast size? Friday Coffee Roasters wanted to know the roast size and percentage of max. It was a 2 kg charge, or that would be a 4.6 pound charge, and this is a 3 kg roasting machine. So thank you for that question. That's something I like to talk about in all my roasts, but you can tell I'm a little bit uh, flighty of mind, and I don't always remember what I'm supposed to say. So 3 kg machine, and I run a 2 kg charge, and that's you. that's honestly, to be honest, if I was to show you the amount of roasted coffee that's, that's back behind the camera, that's the bigger reason why, is I feel bad roasting all this coffee when I don't have a lot of customers. So I wish you all could come by after this video and just pick up some coffee, just so we wouldn't have it sitting around all the time. So yeah, 2 kg charge on a 3 kg machine, 66%, something like that. Peak City Coffees asking, what rate of rise um, were you trying to maintain? Did you or were you trying to maintain? So that's a great question. What was, who said that? Uh, Peak City. Peak City? Peak City Coffee, okay. So for me, that's all phase specific. So you, you really wanna have, and this is how you can build roasts on a piece of paper. You build out your phases, and then you understand your temperatures based on charges and turning points, and then you just fill in the, the gaps. So for me, rate of rise is specific to phases. That first phase will be based on your thermocouple because turning point will dictate, if we all turn green to yellow at 300, then depending on where we have our turning point, 200 or 150, that'll dictate the rate of rise for first phase. So I'm not gonna talk about that because I got me in lots of trouble before I started to figure that all out. But basically, once I get into dry end, so then I'm in the mid phase, and then once crack starts, and then in the development phase, then I have ranges or goals for those phases. So I want six minute, gosh, I'm now telling you guys my golden profile. Ah, it's too late. Six minute dry end on this coffee, at the, that's what I want for this. So I charge and I apply fuel and air to get to six minutes at the color change. Then I wanted a 24 to 26 ROR at that moment coming down. You know what I mean? As I hit crack, I think I said that a little bit. Once I hit crack, I want to be between 12 and 14 ROR. So 24 to 26 going into green or going into mid phase, 14 to 12 going into first crack. And then those are all coming down. And they come down at a very consistent rate based on replicating these rows with similar inputs. So 24 to 26 for mid phase, entry coming out of, you'd be in the 12 to 14. And like you said, I think when I dropped that, I think it was at a six ROR when I dropped the EPO. Good question. Um, I'm not gonna pronounce this um, just cause I can't figure out um, what the um, name is, but uh, the question is, Elephant skin, sometimes I see it looks like on the surface of light roasted beans. Why does this happen? Nice, great question, dude. These are, these are great questions. Look at the surface of the bean a lot when it comes to looking, thinking about development. For you all at home, think of what we're doing. We're putting energy deep into a seed. The seed is swelling. It swells, it roughly is double in size if you roast it kind of dark. Second crack, the beans will be double in size. So there's pressure building inside this bean. First crack is the audible release of this pressure. So at first crack, we're starting to see the beginnings of the swell. As the coffee roasts, it just continues to swell. So if you look at the surface of the bean and you kind of, in a way, track that, track what we call elephant skin or ridging of the coffee. We track the way the ridges start to kind of 
change a little bit, go from no ridges because the bean is so small, to then it starts to swell and it crack, you start to notice very prominent elephant skin and ridges. Then as it starts to rotate a little farther, the ridges almost start to swell even more. And then the valleys between the ridges kind of get dark. And then it almost makes the bean look dark. Then the bean starts to overall swell and some of the ridges pop out. And then you start to see smoothing. You know what I mean? And then the coffee starts to get kind of light colored in a weird way. Then as the whole bean puffs and smooths, then it starts to get chocolate colored and dark. You know what I mean? So I look at surface uh, smoothing as a way to understand internal doneness. Because the more pressure inside, the more done the bean is inside, the more that pressure will swell and smooth the skin. So if you see smooth skin, you're pretty much, if you're not doing crazy roasting or like super high fuel inputs or anything like that, when you see the skin smooth out, you're pretty much right in that medium range. I, I, I haven't had very many medium cups where I drink a coffee and I'm like, whoa, that's balanced. A lot of sweetness, a lot of body, a lot of nuance, a lot of like uh, origin quality. That's to me a medium roast. I don't see that when there's not a lot of smoothing. So I think of mediums as having smoothing. Anything below smoothing, still ridgy, that's still like a light medium. And then very, very ridgy coffees, they're super light. So when you see lots of elephant skin, pick that coffee up and shake it around in your hand and think about, does this coffee feel like a stone or does it feel more like a roasted coffee bean? I'm gonna guess when you have that elephant skin, it's gonna feel like a stone. That's one of the other things I do, is I'll take coffee when it's roasted and just kind of shake it around in my hand just to see how, like, the hollowness of the way it hits off of each other. If it doesn't sound hollow at all, then it's freaking undeveloped. If it sounds super hollow, then it's overdeveloped. You know what I mean? It's gonna be lacking qualities. And one of the ways you can gauge that is on the exterior. So I try and teach all my roasting students to put a lot of, a lot of work and weight into the smoothing of the skin. If you're going for light roasts, you wanna keep that skin kinda of rigid. If you're going for mediums, I would opt for a nice amount of smoothing. If you're going for darks, then you want nice smoothing and a nice chocolatey tone. And I like to think of darks as fully smooth and, and basically getting into the dark chocolate and a little bit of the color is what I mean, and then the beginning of second crack. So that's kind of what I think. But that's a great question. And if you can understand the basically the smoothing quality and how it pertains to cup, that's, that's a very helpful roaster tool while you're roasting. And that's a trier, trier thing, so good, great question. Uh, Rock Hill Brothers Coffee asks, is there any benefit roasting in small batches? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Rock Hill Coffee asks about small batch roasting. And I'm gonna say that I think what you're asking is, hey, I have a 20K machine, I'm gonna roast a 10K charge. Yeah. The, the number one reason is more bites of the apple. That's kind of a Steve Green term, but it, more bites of the apple means you have more opportunities to refine that profile. You know what I mean? When I, used, when I learned how to roast, I learned how to roast on a 50 pound machine. The only replicatable profile size we could get down to was 35 pounds. So when we developed a profile on that machine, it was at 35 pound batches. That was super wasteful when it came to like how much green we needed to develop the profile. Well, eventually I taught that company to buy me a one pound roaster. And so then I can do one pound roasts to develop that profile. So if you're, if you have a, let's say you have a 3kg machine, I would definitely figure out a protocol for one kg to 2kg charges. So that when you're developing your profiles, you're not using as much coffee. If we're using one kg charges on a three kg, that means we get three bites of the apple for every one ch full charge. So instead of doing one roast and being like, oh man, that's three kg, now I got six pounds of coffee that I don't really like, you do a one kg charge, look at it, ooh, it was a little too dark. Okay, the next one you go a little lighter. Oh, okay, that was a little too light. Then you go a little darker, you know what I mean? So you'll get three bites of the apple for every one that your competitor's doing, so that's smart. Another reason is you might have a machine where you really want to push the performance. If you're not getting the performance you want, then, then, then lessen your batch size. If you're having a 20 minute roast and you want a 10 minute roast, well then cut your batch size in half. Do the exact same thing and you're probably gonna have a 10 minute roast. And there's gotta be another reason too. Um, yeah, I'm not thinking of that. There's, I think there's, there's, those are two solidly valuable reasons why you wanna manage or create a protocol so that you can do varied batch sizes. Yep, great question. You guys are killing it, dude. One more question and then we're gonna cut it. If all the variables are maintained, how difficult do you find it to repeat a roast profile? And this is coming from Sterling Soap. 
Sterling Soul. Oh yeah, for sure. I love you guys, man. You guys got me into, sorry, I'm not gonna go there, but like the safety razor. Yeah, thank you, Sterling. Um, yeah, okay, so all variables the same. Okay, so I'm gonna say cup-wise, cup I think it's, it's uh, ultimately doable. I think that if you have, if like I come in tomorrow and my day is 20 roasts of the same coffee, and my goal is to make those roasts so that my customers don't notice any variance on cup, totally doable. I think that's not that hard. I think once you get the coffee and the green, you understand it, you understand your roasting machine, you get all, of, like I said, you have all the variables in control, that replicating that cup is not gonna be that challenging. Now, you're gonna have to learn though how to manage time versus temperature. Because you're never, I mean, I don't say you're never, but to do all 20 of those roasts to the exact same second, to the exact same degree, would be very, very difficult. I've rarely had those days in my 13 years of roasting. I've rarely had days like that. Maybe two, you know what I mean? But, like I said in the beginning, I have nailed all those cups. So as the day progresses, the roaster gets hotter. You know what I mean? So things change a little bit. So you have to be comfortable basically understanding when the coffee is right, when maybe the temperature and um, time are a little not. So that's our goal. That's what we do as a coffee roaster. We need to be able to say, dude, the coffee is right now. And open up the drum and let it out. Even when the temperature reader says it's a degree off, or the temperature or the time is maybe 15 seconds long. That's our job. So for me, I give myself around, I want to say, two to three degrees variance, five to ten seconds. So five to ten seconds time two to three degrees variance I give myself in roasting to basically manipulate the roast or to control the roast to have the cups be the same. Because one might go 15 seconds longer to a later degree, one might be the exact time to the exact temp, the next one might be a little bit faster, a little bit darker, and that's our job as a roaster. So I think having replicating the same roast to the same cup experience, totally doable. I think probably after a year or two of being a production roaster, you should really do that with your eyes closed, you know what I mean? But just know as a roaster, you need to learn to manage time and temperature and not every roast is gonna end at the same second at the same degree. But know they will taste the same. And if you're ever super worried about variance, then do the one thing that we used to do with the company I roasted at, we would save all 20 of those roasts and then blend them all together so that when we, when we packaged them, there was no variance. So it's another tip too. All right. Well, I really appreciate everyone sticking, uh, sticking through this live feed and all those great questions. This is really great. I thank you all. I think the questions might have been better than the actual roast. So I really appreciate you guys all participating. We'll try and do a little bit more of this live stuff. We've been doing lots of stories that we do and we edit. We'll try and do a little more live stuff um, coming down the pipe. But thank you guys all. Um, this is once again, we're going to tune out from Northeast Minneapolis. We'll see you roasters. Have a good day. Cheers. Bye, Sonoma.